Okay, I think the first point is that to define what does mean success in IVF, because before to speak about the double stimulation is an important point, the definition of the success. And today we are, I think, uh, uh, we are agreed that the only definition of the success is the cumulative library rate per intention to treat. This means that if I want to assess the efficacy of my treatment, I need to take in consideration these indicators. But what I want to discuss with you is that uh, we need to take in consideration also the efficiency of the treatment because uh, we need to take in consideration the adverse event. We need to take in consideration how much time we spend to obtain a baby. We need, we need to take in consideration the cost effectiveness of every single treatment. And also we cannot forget the dropout because the dropout is an important indicator when we manage infertility patients, but in particular when we manage poor prognosis patients. And so for me, the definition of the success in IVF is not really easy because we need to put in the balance the efficacy of the treatment, but also the efficiency of the treatment. The first point is that the definition of patients with the low prognosis patients. The low prognosis are patients with a poor ovarian reserve. The low prognosis are patients with a demantar maternal age. But the low prognosis are patients with also with abnormal karyotype because, of course, these patients can we have a lower blastulation rate and maybe a higher aneuploidy rate. The, the, pay, the low prognosis patients also are patients with a monogenic disease because if our goal is to find a good embryo, a, a competent embryo, a healthy embryo, of course, the monogenic disease can impact the success. And also the poor prognosis patients are patients with the severe male factors because of course we cannot forget the male partner. All these, all these patients uh, will have a lower pregnancy rate, of course. We have a, a incidence of a higher dropout rate. And also, of course, in these patients, we need to try to optimize the time because the time for that patient will be very crucial. So everybody knows that the number of the oocyte represent a very crucial point. But what we understood today is that in a poor prognosis patient, we don't have a magic wall to increase the number of the eggs. And so what can we do in these patients? Because of course, the quantity is an important point, but also the quality is another important indicator. And what does mean quality? Quality means for me, blast blastulation rate, because when you go to blastus, this is the only way to assess the competence of the oocyte and the competence of the sperm. And the quality means also the aneuploid rate. This is the only indicator that we have up to now in order to assess the competence of my embryo. This is the picture of my centers. I work in Rome in a big private IVF setting. And, and here you can see that the majority of my patients that I manage every day, so 84%, we manage patients with more than 35 years, and 46% of my patients are more than 40. So this means that every day I manage patients with advanced maternal age, and of course, with a few number of the eggs. Here you can see the distribution of the eggs according with the age of the patients, also the percentage of the patient's population. But what I want to show you is the competence of the oocyte. Look at the blastulation rate. When we increase the age, we, we, we will have, of course, a lower blastulation rate. And this is a very simple indicator in order to assess that, of course, the competence of my oocyte in poor prognosis patients will be very lower. I think before to speak about to do a STEM protocol or when we talk about unconventional stimulation, we need to try to define which is the strategies that we use in our clinical setting. And this is what we do in all patients. Independently from the number of the oocyte, we go to blastocyst. Because our goal is not to collect eggs, is not to perform the embryo transfer, but it is to perform an embryo transfer with a high implantation potential. And the only way is to go to blastocyst, not to improve the cumulative LIBOR rate, but just to select the embryo with the high implantation potential. And of course, when we transfer blastocysts, we can increase per embryo transfer, not per intention to treat our, our chance. 
But the blast, but go to blastosis maybe is not enough if I want to know the quality of my embryo. This is the reason why from 2014, we published this paper, sorry, in 2015, our policy is, uh, the, is to maximize the ovarian response, go to blastosis and perform the PGTA in order not to improve the efficacy of the treatment. So we cannot modify the quality of the embryo, but we, we, we want to improve the efficiency. We want to reduce the number of the embryo transfer. We want to select the embryo, the embryo with the high implantation potential, and we want to improve the chance per embryo transfer. This is our policy. And uh, we published this paper in 2015. Okay, I think uh, now is the time to say that if I collect three eggs in Bologna patients, uh, if I have a patient in front of me with a, uh, with a 40, so with a Devantra maternal age, I can use whatever you want, different protocol, different medication, but the success rate will be 7%. And this is a, a very clear information that I think we need to share with our patients when we start the stimulation in low prognosis patients. Of course, thanks to the Poseidon, so uh, in the previous presentation, we spent many times to, to, to understand the, the value of this uh, definition. Because of course, for each single group, we can tailor the treatment and this is the goal. The point is that if I increase the number of the embryo transfer and the theoretically if I increase the number of the oocyte, of course, in every single group of the patients, uh, according with the Poseidon definition, I can increase my cumulative LIBOR rate. But look, when we have patients at an group two or group four. So when we have patients with advantage maternal age, of course, the impact of the age will be very strong in terms of increasing cumulative chance. This is the reason why our philosophy is to try to maximize in every single patient and in particular in low prognosis patients, uh, the ovarian response. And uh, Carlo did a very good explanation regarding the importance of the FOI index, because this is, this is the only way if we want to assess the quality of my stimulation. Try to correlate the antrophological count with the number of the eggs at the end of the stimulation. But I think one of the most important uh, definition, thanks to the Poseidon group, was to try to tailor the number of the oocytes that we need according with the patients that you have in front of you. Because of course, if I have patients, young patients, if my goal is to, to obtain one competent embryo, maybe 4x, 5x can be enough. But look, if I have a patient at 40, 42, how many eggs I need to obtain the same identical goal, so one competent embryo. Because competent embryo means to arrive to blastocyst and also to have aeoploid blastocyst. So this means that the number of the oocyte is important, but we need to correlate the number of the oocyte according with the age of the woman that we have in front of you. And so what we know today is that if I want to improve my cumulative chance, I need to take in consideration the age of patients, the ovarian reserve, the sperm, because the sperm is an important role to arrive to blastocyst, but not when we have the AO but not when we have blastocyst. And of course, all these parameters must be taken in consideration in terms to improve the efficacy of the treatment per ovarian cycle. But what if we change this paradigm, if we consider IVF efficacy in terms of cumulative LIBOR rate per ovarian cycle, the paradigm has already, has already been changed because we know that the follicologenesis is extremely dynamic. During one ovarian cycle, we have multiple waves not only in the, in, the, in, the, in the early follicular phase, but, but also in the late follicular phase, in the luteal phase. But however, the mechanism behind the regulation of these waves is not fully understood. But thanks to this information, what we know today is that you can start at any time of the menstrual cycle. So it, 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 we know this information because when we have patients, uh, oncology patients in fertility preservation setting, we start at any time because we don't have time. So this means that thanks to the, this knowledge, today we have the possibility to, uh, to tailor the treatment according with the starting days 
of the stimulation in classic way, in conventional way, in the late in the late follicular phase, or we can combine the conventional approach plus the luteal phase stimulation in the same ovarian cycle. All these protocols are possible. Why? Because we have uh, we need the efficiency crab preservation program. If you don't have the crab preservation program in your setting, you're gonna do nothing. Of course, this is an important point because we can implement the uh, unconventional protocol, we can segment the cycle, we can promote the single embryo transfer and also many other factors. But of course, the cryopreservation represents a game changer when we analyze the efficacy of the unconventional protocol. This is theoretically what we have. So we have the follicular waves, we have the luteal waves. In some cases, of course, according with the duration of the menstrual cycle, we can have multiple follicular waves. Our protocol uh, was to try to maximize the ovarian response uh, in, one, in, a, in, a, in a very short time in one ovarian cycle. So usually, our, our, the previous idea was to compare two identical stimulation in two different cycles. The, the first experience regarding the double stimulation was a Shanghai protocol. In Shanghai protocol, the authors used the different stimulation, different gonadotropy in different protocol in the first and the second stimulation. Our, our goal was to compare two identical stimulation in the same ovarian cycle in two different follicular waves. Usually we start with the estradiol priming because we believe that the synchronization is something very important in low prognosis patients because in antagonist we can have the, the, the asynchronism. And so this is the reason why we believe in the estradiol priming. We use uh, uh, recombinant and we start with LH from the beginning of the cycles. In our previous experience, uh, uh, the majority of the data coming from antagonist protocol. Now we have one one trial uh, regard with the, and, and we use the PPOS in both stimulation. But anyway, the majority of the data coming from the antagonist protocol. We trigger with agonist and not to avoid the OHSS, of course, but in order to uh, try to reduce the time of the corporal lutea. So we did. We do the pickup. We go to blastocyst, and in the meantime, after five days, we restart again with identical stimulation, and then we go again. We trigger with agonist. We go to blastocyst, and then we accumulate the biopsy from the first stimulation and from the second stimulation in order to try to to make just one time the PGTA. This is for us is very cost effective in this analysis. So. Our protocol is a double stimulation in PGTA cycle, blastocyst culture, and a combination, of course, of two identical stimulation in one environment cycle. The first question regarding the application of the double stimulation is regarding the competence. What is the competence when I collect the ovocyte from an ovulatory waves? Because, of course, if you don't do nothing, you will lose this ovocyte. And uh, which is the fertilization rate, which is the blastulation rate, which is the oploidy rate. And when I transfer the embryo after unconventional stimulation, which is the quality of my embryo? Okay, just I would like to show you some paper coming from our group. In this paper, uh, we demonstrated that when we collected the ovocyte from second stimulus from the luteal phase, we have the same identical fertilization, the same identical blastulation rate, and the same identical euploidy rate. This means that the time when you start the stimulation does not impact the competency of the oocyte. And another important paper that we published is that when we have the euploid embryo, because the euploidy rate is, is, a, is, a, is, is important, but of course, uh, we cannot analyze the quality of the embryo or the quality of the embryo. This is the reason why when we transfer the oploid embryo coming uh, uh, obtained from second stimulation from luteal phase, we have the same identical life birth rate per transfer. So this means that apparently when we collect the ovocyte from an ovulatory waves, we have the same identical competence. 
But in our experience, um, this philosophy is important because in purpurinosis patients and the mean age of the population in this study was 39, 39, and because this is unfortunately the mean age of our population, the contribution of the luteal phase in the same ovarian cycle increased the possibility to obtain at least one aeoploid blastocyst. And so the point is that these strategies can be useful in terms to try to collect more eggs, try to improve the number of the oocyte, try to increase the number of the patients with at least one neoploid blastocyst. The most important information coming from this approach is that the variability that we have in our patient's population. Because when, we, when you perform this data coming from Bologna patients, so patients according with the Bologna definition, so very bad patients. So when you do the double stimulation with the two identical stimulation in two different follicular waves, look at the variability. Only 40% or 50% of the patients, we will have the same number of the eggs. And only 31%, we will have the same number of the embryo. This means that in this patient's population, the variability during one ovarian cycle with the same identical protocol is very huge. It's very huge. And this is, I think, something that we need to understand also in different patients' population. And the question is why we have this variability, because uh, we have the information that, uh, sorry, if I go back, we have the information that uh, 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 in this patient's population, look, 50% 50, 50 of the patients in very heterogeneous population define at poor prognosis patients, we have this variability, okay? And why we have this variability? Because the vari this is in Bologna, in Bologna patients. Why we have this variability? Because maybe the previous stimulation can be a, an, an effect in the second one. It's just a priming, an, an, an endogenous priming. But also, we did some speculation because maybe uh, the, the 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 high level of the hormone can can improve the ovarian the the ovarian sensitivity in the new follicular waves, or maybe because uh, we are we strongly believe in this aspect is that the agonist trigger. The agonist trigger is important not only to have a LH source, but also we have a FSH source, and this FSH source can induce a down regulation in the expression of the MH, and maybe this. This can be an effect in the second stimulation. So this is just an observational speculation, but of course, this is something that we need to investigate in order to understand why in the second stimulation, we have always, we have a statistically significant more of a site in the second one. Um, after our paper, uh, Nikos and uh, Annalisa Raka wrote a letter in, to human reproduction to say, okay, maybe this is not a luteal phase, because uh, if you trigger with agonists, you will have a bleeding. Okay, maybe this is a two follicular phase. We wrote, uh, we replied, of course, in order to try to, to, to make a discussion regarding uh, what does it mean for us luteal phase. And uh, of course, when you use the GnRH agonist, uh, you can reduce the legs of the luteal phase. This is true. But uh, the hormone level in this period of the cycle are totally different from the, from the first stimulation. And also the luteolysis is patient specific. We cannot predict the menstruation because depend on how many eggs we have, how many follicles, depend on the half-life of the, of the corpora lutea. And also in absence of the stimulation, the growing follicles in the luteal phase of ovarian, of ovarian cycle will, will never reach the full maturity. This is the reason why at the beginning of the story, Shanghai Protocol call it the second stimulation. Of course, maybe this is, I think, not an issue because the terminologies, we can change the terminologies, we can improve our knowledge. This is the reason why maybe seems to be more correct to say second stimulation in the same ovarian cycle. But I think the most important point when you use uh, this kind of protocol is to try to improve the efficiency. I don't know if you have uh, any information regarding which is the dropout rate in your setting. We did the retrospective data in Bologna patients uh, and uh, we, uh, we be, before the, duos, the, the, the era of the duos team, uh, the life birth was 7%. 
But the dropout rate in our setting was amazing, it was 60%, 60-0%. And only 35% of the patients came back to us for the second stimulation and, and, and look at the distribution. Many patients lose time. And lose time means lose chance. This is the reason why the opportunity to perform this kind of the stimulation can be an efficiency strategy in terms to try to reduce the dropout and try to explain to our patients that if we have patients with advanced maternal age with a low number of the potential low antral follicle count. So in these patients, uh, we need maybe more than one cycle if we want to obtain a baby. And this is an clear information that now we try to share with our patients in the first consultation. And the possibility to, to tailor the treatment with the dual steam seems to be an efficiency strategy in order to reduce the dropout because the patients understand that according with the age, according with the ovarian reserve, we need maybe more stimulation in order to try to have chance to obtain one competent embryo. And this is the study, is a retrospective data, of course, so when we compare two different approach, duostim versus two conventional approach. And again, look how many patients come back for the second stimulation, very a few percentage. And the, the, I think the, 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 the duostim opened the door to the new clinical approach. The clinical approach is that the multi-cycle approach. We need to speak with our patients that one cycle is not enough in the majority of the patients and in particular in Poseidon patients. Because here you can see that if we consider the cumulative chance after up to six cycle, six cycle is a lot, I know very well, but Anyway, if you consider the cumulative chance to obtain a baby up to six cycle, here you can see that in all Poseidon group, you can reach very, uh, very good uh, percentage to have a baby. Of course, good, because we need to correlate it, what does mean good in this patient's population. But anyway, this is just to, and to realize that one cycle is not enough to, to make a, a, a and a conclusion of the IVF journey. Of course, when we speak about multiple cycle approach, the dropout rate is, I think, the big problem that we can have because if you increase the number, the, the possibility to have a dropout will be low, will be, will, will be higher. But the question is that the dropout is not only the money. I think uh, some data support that 50% of the dropout is related to other reasons and not only the cost of the treatment. And the many study coming from psychologists support that when we use this approach, this is a, can be a valid option in order to, to involve the patients for, in this uh, IVF journey in order to try to understand that one cycle is not enough. The dual steam protocol and so can be an option because uh, in the because of from the beginning we can explain why we perform two stimulation back to back instead of two conventional approach in PGT A cycle, and this is the data coming from from our colleagues in terms that when you use this approach you can reduce the time to obtain. Uh, aeoploid blastosis. And of course, everybody knows that the time represents another important indicator in terms to improve the efficiency of the treatment. But of course, if we want to take in consideration this approach, we need the efficiency career preservation program. We need to, of course, perform a correct stimulation, a correct drugs, a correct trigger, of course, we believe that this stimulation is very useful when we, when our goal is not to perform the embryo transfer, but is to perform the embryo transfer with high implantation potential. This is the reason why the dual steam, I think, uh, is something uh, uh, that we can take in consideration when you go to blastocyst and when you perform the PGTA. And also we need appropriate counseling. We need to spend time to our patients just in order to understand the pro and cons when you use this approach. And something new is that the possibility to tailor the treatment in progress. Because at the beginning of the story, 
uh, we in the, in the first paper we selected a specific criteria to suggest the duo stim according with the MH, the antral follicle count, and the age. But now our policy is to try to modify our approach according with the embryo that we have after the first stimulation. This is just a retrospective data. Two groups in, in uh, with uh, one group with uh, one or two or three blastocysts. So three blastocysts in patients' population at 40 is, is a lot. But anyway, so in this patient, the option uh, were two. So the first was to go to the second stimulation in order to improve the number of the embryo for the for the PGTA, because of course at 40 the aneuploid rate will be 50 percent, five zero percent, or to make the analysis and then uh, uh, transfer the euploid embryo. So we did uh, a comparison of two strategies, two conventional approach versus so one double stimulation. Uh, here you can see that when you use the double stimulation, of course you can increase the cumulative life per rate per ovarian cycle. But the reason is that because you reduce the dropout. So the big problem in our setting, I think in every single setting, they drop out. Many patients drop for some reason, they lose time, they lose chance, or they change maybe 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 the tree, maybe the, um, the journey. And also you can see the time. Look at the time when you perform this protocol is 18 days. Look at the time when you, you when you make two stimulation, two conventional approach. And this is, I think, another important indicator in order to improve the efficiency of the treatment. And what about the cost effectiveness analysis? So this is the first paper in terms to analyze the cost effectiveness with a, an important indicator. The indicator is ICER ratio, incremental cost effectiveness. So we have, a, so we put in the balance uh, the, the cost of two conventional approach versus uh, the duo steam. So of course the duo steam uh, is more expensive, but this is just the cost for the treatment. You need to take in consideration the cost for the baby. With this strategy, so we can improve the number of the baby, we can improve the number of the patients with more than one neoploid embryo. So, and in these patients at 40 have another euploid embryo frozen, this is an unbelievable opportunity because the patients come to us not for the embryo transfer, but the patients come to us for the family planning and maybe to, to save the possibility to have more than one embryo in this patient population, I think is something very important. This is the th this is the same things when we take in consideration patients candidate for monogenic disease because in monogenic disease you you need to put in the balance not only the impact of the monogenic disease but also the aneuploidy rate because this is the reason why in all monogenic disease we perform also the PGTA. And we, we we try to collect a, we have a paper in progress in terms to efficacy of the PGT, efficacy of the dual steam in PGT ham cycle. And uh, in this case, uh, three blastocysts is not enough, but five blastocysts maybe could be an ideal number of the blastocysts in order to obtain a, a, a euploid embryo, but also a healthy embryo according with a monogenic disease. Some data is coming different protocol, different group, different strategies. This is the paper. This is a randomized control trial coming from France. Randomized control trial does not mean a good study. Uh, uh, this is the this is the uh, uh, the name of this uh, protocol is B steam. I don't know. Sometimes the authors uh, make a confusion. Do steam B steams. Anyway, so if we see the protocol, they use a, a different protocol. Uh, urinary gonadotropin. They they did uh, uh, antagonist uh, uh, protocol in the first uh, and PPOS in the second one. They use ACG. Um, uh, in the first and the second one. So this is totally different protocol compared with our protocol. And another big bias of this study was the design of the study. This is the reason why we wrote two letters after the publication of this study. Do you know why? Because in the control group, when they take in consideration the conventional approach, they did a fresh embryo transfer in good prognosis patients. So this is not, if you want to design a good study, you need to freeze the embryo in any case, because if you transfer the fresh 
in, in if you transfer the good embryo in the in in the control group, of course, this is two different approach, different protocol. And so for us, for us, this this study has a very very a lot a lot bias. This is our our data. Just I would like to share with you uh, our um, our uh, our experience. Uh, up to now, we performed uh, uh, around. Uh, uh, 2000 uh, cycle uh, with the duostim protocol uh, is consistent that in the second stimulation we collect more ovocyte. This is a, what we have in different patients' population when you perform two, uh, um, two stimulation. And of course, again, no different in terms of fertilization, blastulation, and the euploidy rate when we collect the ovocyte from uh, the second stimulation. Of course, uh, no difference in terms of uh, clinical outcome, biochemical pregnancy, miscarriage rate, life birth per single embryo transfer. Of course, this is a strategy. This is not a magic way to, to manage uh, poor pregnancy patients, but this is just a strategy because we need to tailor our treatment. And the tailoring today is not to modify the dose of the medication. Tailoring is, is a mean to try to modify our approach according with the ovarian response, according with the, with the number of the embryo that we have, according with the clinical situation. This is the reason why, uh, of course, we need to collect the data. We need a good study. Uh, we need a good study. Uh, up to now, the, 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 the most important benefit when you use this kind of the stimulation is to try to reduce the time, is to try to reduce the dropout. And I think this is the door, this is the first step to the multi-cycle approach, because we believe that we need to change our mind and to try to explain that this is not one treatment, but this is just one journey. And so we need time and we need maybe more experience. Thank you very much.